Well, amen. What a thought. You may be seated. We'll go ahead and dismiss our kiddos to children's small group. And as they're making their way back, we'd encourage you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Ephesians and the sixth chapter. Ephesians chapter number six. As we continue to study the whole armor of God. Finally, my brethren, in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. Put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies, or the tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. That set the tone and that set the stage for us beginning to piece by piece and part by part equip ourselves with the whole armor of Almighty God. Only with this armor will we be able to uh, endure and overcome the attacks that are imminent, the attacks that will be upon every one of us. This morning we begin with part number one, if you will. Verse number 14. The Bible says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And then Paul continues to write and talks about the breastplate of righteousness and the gospel and the shield of faith and all these other things. But I just want us to each week look at one part of this armor. Each part put on with prayer. We, we read and we, and we sing about that and we'll close the service with that. Onward, Christian soldier. Each piece put on with prayer. So it's important we know what these pieces are. The Bible says this is our only hope of defeating the attacks of the enemy. So how important it is. So this morning a message simply entitled, Loins Girded with Truth. Now we're going to look at the belt of of, of our armor, but specifically we want to have a clear understanding. So I've, I've used the word girdle here because I read out of the King James and I, I thought it might be a little catchy, might help you to pay attention. Uh, I sent the outline to Brother David and he blushed for three days. But, uh, but I pray that we understand that this is more than a, a, just an ornamental belt. It's more than a fashion statement. You know, church today, they're all about the fashion statement. What our buildings look like. What our music sounds like. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the personality of our pastor or the uh, complexities of our ministry. But at the end of the day, everything boils down to truth. And the belt of truth that God has given us. And maybe this morning you're thinking, well, I really don't know why it's all that important. I'm reminded of a story of the late, great Muhammad Ali, the great boxer. Many of you watched him fight through the years. And he was full of personality and wit. Honestly, he was full of himself at times. And the story goes that Muhammad Ali boarded an airplane. And he began entertaining the other passengers as he began dancing around and, you know, talking about, uh, you know, being like a butterfly and a bee and all those kind of things. And it got time for everyone to, to be seated and Muhammad Ali wouldn't be seated. He just kept on entertaining everybody and, and people were kind of cheering him on and it was just a big old time. And finally the head flight attendant walked over and said, sir, you're going to have to be seated and buckle your seatbelt. He said, lady, you must not know who I am. And she looked him square in the eye and he said these words. I am Superman. And Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which she looked at him and said, no, and Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> you and I may have this idea that we can fight our battles alone. But you and I cannot. The Bible says that we are going to find ourselves in the midst of a battle day in and day out. And our only hope of survival and our only hope of victory is in what Paul calls the whole armor of God. Father, I pray that we might buckle up and that we might understand the truth of your word that secures us and strengthens us. Father, may these scriptures come alive in our understanding today. And may we do more than appreciate the armor, but may we apply the armor here and now. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Well, the, the, the first part of the armor for the soldier of Christ, and the Bible says we must put it on. Think about that. It's one thing to know truth at a distance and another thing to embrace truth. It's one thing to appreciate truth and another to accept truth. It's, it's one thing to acknowledge truth and another thing to, to live by truth. But it's important that we just kind of understand the picture here. When we're looking at the, the soldier, Paul understood what it was to be a soldier. Uh, he had witnessed the soldier, he had witnessed the armor of the soldier. We read about it when David tried to put on Saul's armor and it wouldn't fit. But when we come to this first part, it's kind of unusual because I don't know about you men, but me, my belt is the last thing I put on, not the first thing I put on. So we have to understand that the belt of Scripture here is far different than the belt that you and I would wear. It would be thick, a leather belt of protection. It would protect your guts, if you will. It would protect the place of strength. It would protect the place uh, that you wanted to make sure that you were uh, uh, guarded against attack. And with this belt, it would hold the soldier's sword and other pieces of artillery. It was used to gather his long flowing robe or his tunic. We'll talk more about that in a moment because it's important we understand it. And this belt would anchor every other piece of the body armor. Next week we're going to be looking at the breastplate of righteousness. And it is anchored in the girdle or in the belt. I was kind of struggling with this this week as I, I tried to come up with a visual aid, if you will. And I, I was eating lunch on my wife and I Friday in, in Elizabeth Town's newest sandwich shop. And, and I was sitting there and one after the other after the other, these officers kept coming in. Police officers and wildlife officers and, and some from the state parks. And can I tell you, they did not have some little piece of leather. They did not have some little braided belt, some little piece of nylon tied together. But now they had a belt. I mean a big, thick, leather, heavy-duty belt as if they were ready for battle. And in that belt, they had a gun and a taser and handcuffs and, and all kinds of things that I didn't even know what they were. But they were holding so many parts of the artillery that that officer would need. Not on a day of peace, but on a day of battle. Not when the expected came, but when the unexpected came. And how important and how urgent it is for us to be equipped with such a belt. I want to give you three things to consider this morning. Number one, we're going to look at the purpose of our girdle or of our belt. Number two, the posture. And number three, the power. Number one, the purpose of this belt is what truth declares. Now, when we think about truth, we want to understand this is God's truth to us, which is His Word, and it is our truth to God, which is our integrity, our character. In other words, it's us being honest about who we are. Many today would say, you know, I'm okay with the decorative belt. I'm okay with the fashionable belt. I'm okay with just looking as though I have a belt. And the Word of God is saying you must equip yourself with the belt of truth. It's very possible for us to convince everyone around us that we are Christians and that we are faithful to God and that we are a soldier of Christ. But when the battle comes, we will fall if only we have that which is fashionable and that which is decorative. So we understand we're going to talk about the truth of God's word, but it's important right here and now that we just be honest with ourselves and say, is there truth and integrity behind my claim of Christianity? A couple of things the truth of God's word declares. Number one, God's truth establishes our moral absolutes. Now, that may be a term that you're not all that familiar with, moral absolutes. 
But let me just tell you, that's what the 21st century is trying its best to teach our young people that does not exist. They would say there are no moral absolutes. What is morally absolute to Mike may not be morally absolute to Bob and vice versa. That each of us can in our own way, in our own timing, through our own intellect and our own understanding, we develop our own determinations of morality. And therefore, nothing is truly absolute. Beloved, may I say to you, there is very little that is absolute. But the Word of God is just that. Amen? Amen. Everything is anchored around that truth. You and I are making a decision today, and let me say it is very tempting as we listen to, as we listen to the lie of Lucifer. That would say, oh, it's okay. People can live any old way they want to. People can make decisions any old way they want to without any concern of what is absolutely true. No, I'm not up here to browbeat anybody or to in any way put anyone down. But at the end of the day, it is not up to me to determine absolutes, but to simply accept the fact that God who made me and everything that is, was, or evermore shall be, He made the rules. He is the governor. He is the one uh, that, that, that through, through the dictates of Scripture has established right from wrong. Now we get that in every other area of life. I'll leave here in a few minutes and I'm going to go to Beulahville and preach and share about the camp. I'm excited about that. It's an hour and two minutes. Tiffany looked it up on the GPS. And that's depending on me obeying every traffic law. Now imagine, and I will. I will. I don't, I don't drive real fast. That's just not me. I'm afraid I might miss something. But the fact of the matter is, if I'm going down the highway out here and I'm doing about 85 and I get pulled over by the fellow with the blue light and he comes up to the side of the car and says, hey, buddy, you were going 85. And I look him square in the eye and I say, officer, I'm perfectly comfortable with 85. I don't think 55 is a very fair speed limit. Personally, I think it's a ridiculous fault that we can only go 55. So I'm good with 85 and he'll look at me and go, Sounds good to me. No, we understand that there's an absolute speed limit, right? There are all kinds of things. Man today is trying to, to pull a, a fast one on Mother Nature. But there are certain things that Mother Nature dictates because Mother Nature is governed by Father God. If you play a game, basketball, baseball, football, or soccer, or any other game you might play, you understand there are rules to that game. You don't make them up as you go along. And when God created us, He set a standard of governance and absolutes. The substance of truth is the Bible. The spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. And the two go hand in hand. Listen, the Bible says it's very important that we know the Word of God and that we are in a close relationship as we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will interpret the Word of God and He'll interpret it as true and clear. He is not the author of confusion. Very few things in the Word of God are, are confusing to us unless we want them to be. Unless we have an argumentative spirit. But when we go to the Word of God and say, God, your Word is true. It is pure. It is right. It is holy. And whenever I don't agree with it, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It means I'm wrong. The Word of God is non-negotiable. I'll say this and move on. We're living in a time in America where there are many who want to rewrite the Constitution. And that's frightening to me. It's scary. I'm absolutely amazed at the wisdom of our forefathers who somehow were able to pin words on paper that so wonderfully have governed us all these years. And we realize the importance to sticking to that. Not tearing up the Constitution and throwing it away. Not acting as though we know better than our founding fathers. But may I say to you, the founding fathers were not inerrant and perfect. Although I am such a believer in our Constitution. But when I open up the Word of God, I realize there is no hope and no measure of, uh, uh, of falsity. It is every bit true. It is every bit relevant. It is more clear and more accurate than the 6 o'clock news will ever be. His word is non-negotiable. You say, well, we know that. 
May I say to you that most mainline denominations today have drifted far from the Word of God. The Bible said of itself in the last chapter of Scripture, any man that takes away from or adds to shall not have part in the kingdom of heaven. So what we need to do is take the Word of God at face value, to take it as true, and to say, God, I love your Word because it is your Word to me. I don't question everything within it. Much of it I do not understand, but I accept it all. The Word of God, it establishes our moral absolutes. Number two, the Word of God equips us with a moral compass. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What are the thoughts and intents of our heart today? What is our moral compass? What do we use to determine direction and guidance in life? Now, I think I could get to Beulahville. I'm not sure, but I think I can get there. But as soon as this service is over, I'm punching Beulahville Baptist Church in my GPS. And even though I've never met that woman whose sweet voice leads me every day, even though I don't know her personally, I trust her. Somehow, I just believe that she knows what she's talking about. Because honestly, up until this point, she's never led me astray. That woman on the GPS. The fact of the matter is, I have to make sure that she knows where I'm going so that she knows how to get me there. I serve a God today that knows my beginning and He knows my ending and He knows every step and every turn and every detour and every roadblock and every bump in the road along the way. And I can trust Him. I can trust His Word as my moral compass. Amen. There's not one family issue that couldn't be settled from this book. There's not one church split that could have not been prevented by this book. There's not one denominational fight going on that couldn't be settled in an instant if they just get back to this book. But somewhere along the way, man said, I can't trust the Bible as my moral compass. And the soldiers to be equipped with the belt of truth. Think about this. I'm excited because we're closer than ever before of building our church building, our ministry center at the camp. It's getting closer day by day. And, and at some point, there's going to be a sealed set of drawings, architectural plans, engineering stamps placed upon them. And then these plans will be put out for bid. A, a contractor selected will break ground and they will begin the process of building the building. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that the framers come in and say, you know, I think I know better than the architect. I think rather than using two by sixes, we'll use two by fours. Or, or rather than going 16 inches on center, we'll go 24 inches on center. And, and, then the, and then the plumbers come in and say, well, you know, I think we'll just do things kind of our own way. And the electricians, I think we'll just kind of do things our own way. Friend, can I tell you, that building would likely not ever get built. And if it did get built, I sure pop would want to go in it. Right? Because everybody can't do things their own way. We have to acknowledge that there's a master plan, that there's an architect, that there's an engineer, that there's one who knew what he was doing before the very first stone was laid. And for us, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the author and finisher of our faith, the architect of all of nature and all of mankind. You know, we're to be governed by something. And for me, it's biblical truth. Psalm 119, 105 says this, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Why? Because without it, I'm in darkness. Number two, let's move quickly. Not only the purpose of our girdle, but secondly, the posture of our girdle. The posture that brings to us from this belt. That is what truth demands. We understand the declaration of truth, but what does God's truth demand of us? 
We love the old song, stand up, stand up for Jesus. But can I tell you, it's more than standing up. It's standing on the word of truth. It's standing in the presence of God. It's standing up for the truths of God's word. It's standing for the principles of our faith. It's standing out in the midst of the crowd. And it stands it together as the church of God. We stand up for what we believe. We stand up for our favorite football team. Our favorite entertainers, our favorite political parties and pundits. But somehow the church is sitting on her hands just waiting for eternity to come. It's time, beloved, that we put on a belt of truth and we proudly and boldly proclaim not anything of our own doing of our own good, but the foundational principles of our faith and that is the word of God. Amen. So what is the demands of Scripture? A couple things. Number one, that we adhere to its commandments. And by the way, there are more than ten. Somehow we've taken the Word of God and we've begun using it as a book of suggestions. You know, it's like, well, I can take it and I can kind of pick and I can kind of choose as if I'm at a buffet. Right? Can I tell you, if you take me to a salad bar today, there's not a lot of need for everything there. Just show me the lettuce, show me the bacon bits, the croutons, and the cheese, and I'm good. Amen? Anybody else there? I mean, they got all kind of other things that somebody spent a lot of time chopping up. For nothing. Friend, God has given us 66 inerrant, infallible, totally inspired books. And He doesn't call us to pick and choose those things that are palatable, those things that we like, those things that we are pleased with, or even those things we agree with. But He said it's all given by the inspiration of God. It's all profitable. It's all good for doctrine and reproof. We sang last week, standing on the promises that cannot fail. Can I tell you, every promise of man will fall. Every dictator has fallen. Every political party goes in and out of power like the changing of the guard. But from the very beginning, the first breath of man that God placed in him, God's word is secure. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot, not one tip. I don't know about y'all, Joe, get up early this morning and see the full moon. And it was pretty last night, but it was amazing this morning. I mean, it looked as big as all outdoors. It filled half the sky over the lake. And I thought, wow, isn't that something? Only God could have put something that you know, majestic and, and, and magnificent up there. But at the end of the day, it is temporary and God's word is permanent. Amazing. In fact, who is Jesus? He's the way, the truth, and the life. Everything that God wanted us to know about His Son is placed in this book. Everything that God wanted us to know about creation is placed in this book. Everything that God wanted us to know about heaven and eternity is placed in this book. There are people today who in an entire village may have one copy of the Word of God and they tear its pages out carefully and they trade those pages and they read those pages one at a time over and over and over realizing that it is great spoil, the psalmist said, to even have the Word of God. And most of us have copy after copy of the Word of God that hardly ever gets open. There's an adherence to the commands of Scripture that God's called us. And by the way, where does judgment begin? It doesn't begin at the governor's mansion or at the White House, but it begins at the church meeting house. Number two, not only does the Word of God give us the adherence to His commands, but also it is all about the obedience to its commands. Our marching orders. Do you know that in the Word of God there is never a marching order of retreat? When it comes to our battle, and there is never the marching order to halt. We've chosen every Sunday to read and to sing the words of the old hymn, Onward Christian Soldier, Marching as to War. I would say to you that it seems in the past few generations the church has retreated into the safety and security of the church meeting house and we gather together and we sing about being the family of God and we sing about when we all get to heaven but at the end of the day God has not called us to be a secret serving saints sitting in, 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 in a pew but He's called us to be the ecclesia those out there confronting the issues and confronting those in our society that are standing against the Word of God. Now let me tell you very clearly, we stand with compassion. We stand of a calm and a concerned heart. 
but we stand nonetheless. When we study, the Bible says we're to rightly divide the word of truth. When we worship, the Bible says we're to worship in spirit and in truth. When we pray, we listen for the very voice of truth. When we speak, we speak truth and love. Truth is essential to the believer. That's why we put it on first. Number three, and I'm done. We've seen the purpose of our girdle or belt. We've seen the posture. And now thirdly, the power of our girdle. The power of our belt. What truth delivers? What truth delivers to you and to me and to the church? Two things very quickly. Number one, victory for the believer. That belt had both a defensive and an offensive purpose. So first off, we look at the defensive protection that our belt gives us. Satan is coming against us. He's wanting to attack us daily. And we need to understand that this belt offers an amazing level of protection. Truth causes every dart to fall off. Every uh, uh, a fiery attack to be quenched. Truth, that is how we dispel the lies of the enemy. That is how we dispel the temptations of the enemy. Because of the truth that we know. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. You know this text. Wherefore, seeing we are also so compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Here we go. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This is an athletic term, but it is also quite fitting for the soldier. Now, I noticed that none of you were wearing tunics today. I'm not sure when tunics went out, but I'm glad they did. A tunic would be a long flowing robe, uh, much like a train that a bride would wear. Well, the Bible says that this belt, uh, among its many purposes, uh, the soldier would gather up his tunic and tuck it into his belt to ready him for battle. Now, there's many illustrations and things that I could share, but I decided to look there in Hebrews 12 because I believe there are many things that are encumbering today the Christian soldier. Keeping us from battle, keeping us from fighting the good fight, keeping us from being effectual in our defense against the enemy. The writer of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. So all of these things that are, that, that, that are holding us back and, and all of these things that are keeping us down, he says to gather up like those long flowing robes. To gather up like the tunic. But now that I have them gathered up, what am I to do with them? Two options. Number one, just hang on to them. Can you imagine trying to run? Trying to persevere? Trying to do battle? Holding all of that? No, the Bible says that we're to gather it up and to tuck it under the belt of truth. The truth is that as a born again believer, I'm justified. My sins have been cast into the sea of forgiveness. So why do I hold on to the guilt? Why do I hold on to the shame? Think about this. The truth of God's word, it frees us from sin. The Bible says in John 8, 32. And we shall know the truth. And the truth shall set us free. It frees us from sin. It frees us from shame. It frees us from stress. Rather than carrying those long robes behind us or gathering them up and trying to hold them and, and deal with them every day on our own, the Bible says that we can, we can cast our care upon Him, that we can cast our tunic in the belt of truth. Now, you can try to cast all those cares on every other thing. I can gather up all of that sin and stress and strife and shame and all. And I can try to say, baby, help me bear this. And she'll make the load lighter, but she cannot bear it, nor can I. I can read every self-help book. I can attend every seminar. I can try everything, but only Christ relieves me from the pain 
of trying to bear it all alone. Everything I face, I can go to His Word. And it's not some kind of a, a, a you know, a, a name it and claim it type philosophy. But truly, every issue that I have, the Word of God in truth deals with it. Victory for the believer, that's our defensive protection. But number two, and I'll close. Victory to the believer. I mentioned that this belt contains all of the weapons that we need. All of our artillery, everything is connected. It keeps everything together. So what does truth do? It gives me conviction. I don't have to make up the rules. I don't have to figure out what's right for me and what's right for you. But God has established that. Imagine if we're trying to play a game and we're just making up the rules as we go along. Some of you probably try to do that. But it's over our pay grade. We cannot effectively do both. So he says, I'm going to establish the rules. And your job is to establish your conviction. And my conviction is that I trust the word of God. It gives me confidence in battle that I can trust the truths of Scripture. It gives me courage knowing that at the end of the day I am victorious, but only with that belt of truth. <coughs> Isn't it awesome to know that there is a source of ultimate truth? Amen. Isn't it awesome to know that it's unchanging and unwavering? It is not debatable. It does not have to be elected or voted out of office. Truth is just that it is true. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I just want to ask you as we close this morning, do you have a grasp of truth today? I believe that there's one thing that the enemy's coming against the church more than ever before. It's trying to deny that there is truth still. We began by sharing with you that the message was about two things. Number one, God's truth to you. That's his word. But now it's time for us to respond about our truth to God. We can't play games with God because he knows the truth. We might fool everybody else, but we can't fool him because he is true. Truth is the standard by which everything is measured. Your relationship with the Lord, is it based on truth? Or is it based on suppositions? I guess I'm okay. Is it based on an outward appearance? I think I got everybody pretty well convinced. Or is it based on this old book? It says of me that I'm a sinner. For all of sinning come short of the glory of God. They're none righteous, no, not one. And that he is the Savior. The Bible says of itself that because of our sins, we would be separated. But because of his grace, we can be saved. Fact is, you and I are trusting this book. If we say that we're believers, we're trusting this book for all of eternity. But this book is worthy of our trusting for all of our lives as well. Father, I pray that you would speak to every heart and every mind and every life in this building. And God, that you would reveal to us your great truth, the truth of your word. And God, if there's one person today here that their relationship with you is based on anything other than your truth, how I pray today, God, you would convict us. And God, you would challenge us. And Lord, we would be truthful with you. Lord, I pray that you would peel back the layers. Lord, that we've placed over our lives and expose the very truth of who we are. Our behavior, our attitude. Lord, if there's anyone here that Lord cannot say with full assurance that they have trusted you. And trusted the truth of your scripture for salvation. God, that today might be the day of salvation. Right now would be their appointed time. God, help us as the late church to always stand for the truth of your word. We acknowledge that all other ground is sinking sand. We acknowledge that we need this belt of truth to hold everything together. God, no matter how beautiful the setting, how elaborate our facilities, 
how awesome our worship experience. God, it is the truth that sets us free, the truth that holds us together, and the truth that will enable us to have victory in the days ahead. In Jesus' sweet name, amen. Would you stand your feet all over the house of God? There's a decision upon your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Oh, I'd love to just to pray with you and encourage you. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's prayer or some other decision. I'm here, Tips here. Others will be here to help you in any way. As we sing and as we respond to the call of God, would you come and do business with Him? See, when we put on our belt, you need to put it on straight, you need to put it on firm, you need to put it on tight. Why? Because it holds everything else together. Father, may we always stand for truth in this place, individually and collectively. Thank you for the soldiers in the army of the Lord and for what you're doing here at the Lake Church. Jesus Christ. 